Hello everyone, uh, my name is Human Pedro Sajot and uh, in this lecture I will give an overview of the Android programming. And the reason that uh, Android programming is being taught in uh, network programming in, with Java is because the Android uh, framework uh, and uh, is uh, programmable with Java and uh, you can write Android application with Java programming languages and also uh, a mobile app uh, which is written for an Android device uh, requires if it's a uh, sophisticated application usually requires a backend server to communicate with and it's an internet based application or network based application so it uh, uh, fits in the context of this uh, course uh, to give a very high level uh, overview of the Android programming uh, of course uh, it does not uh, feel um, uh, in the whole, uh, in just uh, during one uh, yeah, lecture to talk about Android programming in detail, therefore you can refer to these references for more in-depth and uh, detailed uh, explanation of uh, 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 and uh, of the features that gives you Android framework. The outline of this uh, lecture will be first I will talk about uh, what are mobile web apps and native apps and uh, why uh, we should consider to develop our application as a mobile web app or to decide to go for a native app. Then uh, I will introduce the Android platform, give a high level uh, view of that and then uh, we go uh, to the main part which is the Android programming and also uh, just uh, I will talk one slide about user experience and its importance uh, mobile app versus uh, native app on the right side you can see a web app of uh, Amazon uh, service and when we say web app this means that you need to actually enter amazon.co.uk for example in your browser this URL and then it will uh, you can browse your uh, the Amazon service in the browser so it's a web app but a native app if you want to access to the Amazon's native app then you need to install its application from uh, Google Play Store for example uh, in case of Android and uh, then um, after installation you can access their services so uh, you have two ways of designing your service so which one you need to go a mobile web app you access usually browser based right it's a browser based internet service and uh, for handheld uh, mobile devices and the core technologies uh, in a mobile web app uh, core technologies are HTML CSS and JavaScript the advantages of uh, mobile web app are uh, that um, um, they are they provide you cross-platform compatibility because as far uh, uh, when you just need to care about if the user has a browser and there is a browser uh, in any mobile uh, in, in any operating system uh, that is being used by the mobile phones and uh, they are usually therefore cheaper and easier to maintain because you need to maintain uh, less versions of your application and uh, therefore they're simple and ubiquitous access however the disadvantage is that it requires customization across different browser versions because if you're using advanced features of uh, JavaScript and HTML uh, latest version maybe there are some old browsers that doesn't support that and you should take care of that 
and you have also uh, uh, in a web app uh, limited access to mobile hardware and software let's say if you want to have a very high-end um, game app um, that wants to leverage the whole uh, hardware uh, benefits of an end device and also they generally require internet connection and there are at least one that they have to connect to get the service and then to get updated however a mobile native app is built specifically for a particular device and operating system advantages of that is that it leverages the device specific hardware and software and it can work offline and you have a better visibility in app stores therefore you can immediately make money by for example you can make uh, per download or per uh, the user needs to pay the disadvantages are that there are different versions of the app for different platforms uh, so you should choose uh, to support each platform and also keeping apps up to date therefore is costly and the content publishers also have to share information about their subscribers with the App Store uh, in case that you care about that and uh, note that um, in this lecture when we talk about Android programming we're talking about Android applications and therefore we're talking about native apps so uh, that's the scope of this uh, lecture to give you a sense of a mobile app uh, and where it locates uh, you can see here a simple um, game app for example uh, that, he, that uh, um, supports a multiplayer game over internet connection so uh, you can see that your game app uh, will be installed uh, on the uh, uh, end devices uh, so um, your game app will be on the end devices uh, and uh, then one of these game apps in order to create a game it needs a you need a backend server that we call it for example lobby server uh, that is on another machine uh, there for example it registers the game in a game instance uh, for the uh, other players therefore multiple players can uh, play with each other through this game instance that resides in the lobby server so as you can see actually there are network communication between the game app and the lobby server uh, and your Android program is here while you have several things going on on the backend server here I start uh, with an overview of Android platform by explaining Android operating system and uh, the application lifecycle uh, in Android Android operating system is a is Google's Linux, Linux based uh, open source operating system that has a Linux kernel that is optimized for mobile phones uh, and uh, it is uh, it has open source application development libraries such as SQLite, OpenGL and the Media Manager and it has a runtime to host and execute Android applications uh, including uh, uh, the current uh, runtime is called Android Runtime, which is uh, uh, in abbreviated versions ART. An application framework to expose uh, system services, uh, including the window manager, location manager, databases, and telephony uh, and sensors. And the user interface framework and the set of pre-installed applications as you can see here uh, the Linux kernel is uh, in the bottom if you want to uh, demonstrate it as a layered uh, version uh, where uh, it provides different drivers for phones, uh, hardware and sensors and uh, then on top of that there are open source libraries and the Android runtime here the Dolvik virtual machine was the old version of the runtime Android runtime which is no more supported
and exists in the latest operating systems. And on top of that application framework that uh, provides different uh, frameworks for programming your Android using uh, uh, devices features. On top of that some uh, pre-installed applications such as phone contacts and browser. To program uh, Android applications, it is important to know how application lifecycle works in Android operating systems. Uh, and it's different from uh, desktop applications, the lifecycle of uh, Android applications. Android applications have limited control over their own lifecycle. And uh, each application runs in its own process and they have different priorities and knowing these priorities are important to write a user-friendly uh, application and uh, to create a, the best user experience. Android can kill applications without warning to free resources for higher priority applications and the application's priority is equal to that of its highest priority component because each application has several components and each component has different priorities or may have different priorities and it's important to structure the application uh, to ensure that it has the right priority for the work it's doing. Here uh, you can see that uh, there are different processes can provide different priorities for the application. For example uh, from the top to the bottom uh, there are the priority from high uh, will go to low and um, for example um, what does each of these things mean uh, is explained uh, here that actually uh, that active uh, process are those applications that components uh, are those application components that the user is interacting with which means that they are completely uh, the component that the user is right now interacting with it and using it and it can see on top of the screen it can be seen on top of the screen a visible uh, process are those activities uh, which aren't in the foreground but it still can affect what the user sees on the screen it could be uh, behind a, uh, another screen but it's still visible uh, to the user so they have the second priority second highest priority and started services are those processes that are hosting actually services you may you know services are those that will be running on the background for example playing a music or downloading a file and background are those processes that hosting activities which aren't visible and don't have any running services you may open an application and then next open another application that completely makes the other application invisible so that would be your background application background process and for the purpose of uh, fast uh, launching of applications actually Android can cache some information and some data of the previously uh, launched applications so if you relaunch them uh, it can help to become open faster so these are the empty processes that are no act that they have no active application components and uh, in the slides I uh, refer you to a video YouTube video that actually demonstrates this application state uh, also in another way and uh, if you are interested you can watch there. Having a background about the application 
uh, about the Android uh, platform and uh, application lifecycle. Now we can start uh, to learn about Android programming. Uh, in this uh, section, I talk about Android SDK, uh, software development kit, and uh, application model and components in Android, and the uh, processes and threads, uh, permissions, networking, and location. The features that are uh, provided for location and how you can uh, uh, use the location feature of the mobile devices. Uh, the development environment in Android. Uh, you need to first download Android Studio. Uh, that includes uh, integrated development environment, that is an ID, uh, and Android SDK tools, platform tools, and the latest Android platform comes with it and there are Android system images uh, for the emulation uh, that actually uh, you can uh, test your application in different uh, the operating system, different versions of operating systems, different devices uh, in emulation uh, and also uh, you need to have the Java development kit uh, installed beforehand Android SDK provides API libraries and developer tools that are necessary to build debug apps and test your Android applications. It includes uh, different uh, features such as uh, build tools, SDK tools, and uh, platform tools, and uh, it has a rich documentation and uh, SDK platforms and there are system images comes with it and Google APIs to use the Google features in your app and uh, it has the uh, libraries uh, that are to support backward compatibility versions for Android Framework APIs if you want to add the Play uh, Google Play billing to your app and Google Play licensing uh, to your app you can use that uh, to implement your application in Android, you need to know the application model and components. Every Android application consists of uh, some loosely coupled uh, components and uh, an application manifest that actually it's a metadata about the components bindings. The application components uh, include activities and UI design elements that are actually the presentation layer of your application and uh, there are services that are actually components that run in the background to perform long-running operations that we will explain these things uh, in the following slides and there are intents that is a powerful inter-application message passing framework and there are broadcast receivers and content provider that actually uh, it will not be covered in this lecture. Applications uh, application manifest is actually the uh, metadata about the application and every Android project has a manifest file uh, that actually explains the structure and metadata of the application and its components and the requirements such as the permissions and uh, the may, uh, this uh, manifest file is called Android Manifest uh, and it's an XML based uh, uh, file. An example of a manifest uh, uh, file is uh, like this that it has a uh, application uh, tag that uh, it explains uh, uh, different features of your applications. For example, this application allows its data to be backed up whenever there is a system backup and uh, it, is, uh, it refers to its uh, icon file and the label that is going to be shown for this application and the theme file. Uh, it explains which theme file is used for this application and also it has uh, one or several activities uh, that we will explain what are they but for example it has at least one main activity uh, that uh, this main activity has a name and uh, it 
sh it says in the intent filter that this main activity uh, uh, this activity is the main activity uh, which is the activity that will be starting uh, as the first activity and it does not require any uh, intent uh, message to be started and also it will be therefore as a launcher that means that it will be shown in the uh, Android uh, screen uh, to be selected uh, by the user to be launched and now uh, we explain uh, what are actually activities an activity represents a screen uh, that an application can present to its user and therefore it's the visible part of your application to the user and to create an activity you must create a subclass of activity class and then uh, you control the logic of the activity and you define the logic of the activity by implementing its callback methods some of its uh, important callbacks such as uncreate and unpause I will explain that uh, these callback methods uh, refer to the activity's life cycle and each activity has a has life cycle actually here is an example of the activity class so uh, we define as you can see in Java we define a main class a main activity that extends the activity class and therefore it inherits the callback methods of the activity class so it can override uh, those inherited uh, callback methods so for example on create uh, we define that we design uh, we decide that uh, to get the uh, saved instance uh, in, uh, state uh, which is actually the information that has been saved uh, when the application was uh, closing for example so uh, on recreating it actually can reuse those information to get back to the state that was uh, left in the last time and uh, then we set content view uh, that uh, with a uh, UI uh, that we decided for example uh, we designed on activity main so it presents this on the uh, UI on the screen uh, for this main activity so here is the life cycle of the uh, activity so upon creation uh, the uncreate callback will be called and then uh, when it is created the unstart uh, immediately will be called so you can override each of these callbacks uh, to actually uh, mm, uh, define what your application needs to do upon creation or, or when it's started because when it goes to the started your application will be visible uh, to the uh, user so actually user can see <coughs> uh, this activity and then on resume will be called uh, if for example it was stopped uh, and uh, it comes back uh, to a visible mode is still on the resumed is also visible your application if it's partially visible because another activity can pops up uh, it goes to the paused mode so you can define also what to do your, what your application needs to do uh, when it is paused for example and uh, whenever it comes back to the uh, first screen again on resume will be called so you actually need to know this life cycle of activity in order to have a uh, good and lo uh, logical uh, user experience uh, to design a logical user in experience for the user and um, upon stop uh, it, uh, if it's hidden it the callback method stopped uh, will be called uh, and your on a stop can come by the callback on a start and uh, on restart to the visible mode again so uh, this life cycle activity life cycle is an important uh, part of the uh, activity that you need to know uh, I explained that activities are screens actually uh, that will be displayed for the uh, uh, user 
Uh, but to design a user interface, uh, there are terminologies in Android that needs to be uh, understood. There are views and view uh, groups. Views are the base class for all visual interface elements, and view groups are a uh, group of multiple views. Uh, as child, it includes multiple views. And uh, fragments are, represents a behavior or a portion of a user interface in an activity. And uh, interestingly, fragments have their own life cycle state and back stack. And activities represents the window or screen being displayed. And to display a UI, you assign a view to an activity, and the activity will be uh, visible in that view. Intents uh, to communicate between activities and uh, applications. Uh, there is a message passing mechanism called intent in Android uh, that um, actually using intents, using intents, you can uh, explicitly uh, start a particular service uh, or activity uh, by using its class name, by hard coding the class name, specifically mentioning this activity, or implicitly that in that case you uh, request an action on a piece of data and the system actually uh, uh, recognizes which activity fits best uh, for your request. And also, you can broadcast the occurrence of an, e e e of an event. For an explicit start of a new activity, uh, in this example, uh, yeah, for example, uh, there is um, a... Uh, uh, you want to have a simple chat application and you want to choose a contact uh, from contacts. Uh, and you want to use your own contact uh, activity. Therefore, um, you actually hard code uh, the name of uh, your contacts activity that you implemented uh, when creating the uh, intent, and then uh, you start the activity uh, and uh, you assign that you want uh, to actually get the response back, uh, the, con the selected contact back. However, if you uh, want the use a previously registered uh, contacts uh, activity by your system uh, by the by Android, uh, you can actually mention the action of uh, pick and uh, referring to a URI of this uh, of the contents contacts uh, and actually the operating system Android itself uh, search for the registered uh, activities uh, for this uh, type of application uh, for this type of action and in case that there are multiple it actually uh, suggests uh, the user to pick uh, one of the registered uh, related um, um, activities. Otherwise, it chooses uh, the one, the the only one that is registered. So uh, now uh, we said that the other component type of component uh, in Android uh, are uh, the services, the service component types. A service is an application component. Uh, that can perform long-running operations in the background and does not provide a user interface so it's not an activity a service can run in the background to perform work even while the user is in a different application it is like as when you're listening to music or downloading a file in your Android phone and a component can bind to a service to interact with it and uh, to get uh, its um, feedbacks uh, or results from this service. And a service might, for example, some of the use cases for uh, using services are uh, network transactions, playing music, or performing file I.O. 
To create a service, you must create a subclass of service. And you override the callback methods to control the behavior of the service, as in activities. And there are different callback methods uh, for a service, such as uh, on a start command that is called whenever uh, a service is started for the first time, and on bind. However, unbind is when a component wants to uh, bind to existing service. In case that a service is not started, it actually uh, starts a, a new instance of the service. And uncreate and undestroy. And you need to declare the service also in the manifest as uh, um, you um, introduce uh, the activities in your in the manifest file the notion of uh, processes and threads uh, also are in Android uh, operating system um, so by default all components of the same application uh, run in the same process However, uh, you can define in the manifest that different components of the same application are to be run in different processes. Uh, you can name each process uh, differently in the manifest file. And about the threads, uh, the same things uh, that uh, you have learned in multi-threading uh, lecture are true here. Uh, just uh, I, I I would like to explain uh, that uh, when an application is launched, the system creates a thread of execution uh, for the application, and the main thread is called UI thread because it it's the thread uh, that interacts and are meant and is meant to interact with the Android UI components. And the rest of the threads are worker threads. So you don't, you shouldn't uh, design your application that perform long operations uh, with the UI thread. So um, because then uh, the user ex the user will have a awful experience, uh, a very uh, slow application. On the other side, using uh, worker threads um, can cause uh, uh, the problem of uh, manipulating your UI uh, with a worker thread that uh, this UI uh, toolkit is not thread safe and it causes problems. So therefore remember these two rules that do not block the UI thread with a long running operation and do not access the UI th uh, toolkit uh, from outside the UI thread meaning from uh, with um, worker threads so here is an example of a wrong implementation let's say on a callback on click for a button you cre create a new thread in order to download uh, an image and uh, then uh, when this new thread downloads the image it directly modifies the uh, image view uh, um, so this is actually wrong worker thread is updating image view which is not thread safe So, for this purpose, there are different ways of implementing. One of them is async task. You can use async task to perform the blocking operations in a working thread, in a worker thread, and then publishes the results on the UI thread. To do that, you must subclass async task and implement the do in background callback method. 
and then to update the UI you use the on post execute callback method let's see next let's see it with an example so as I mentioned uh, you extend this class async task so we call it download image task it receives three types of parameters that I explain what they are and so in the callback methods the long-running operation which is loading image from network is being done in the callback method do in background so it loads image and returns a bit bitmap type right the return type this thread this uh, callback method will be operated by the worker on progress update is to show the progress if you want to uh, show, show the progress percentage but here on post execute will be executed by the UI thread right U I'm very bad writer uh, using this pen actually <laughs> uh, so the UI thread um, is setting image bitmap as in the previous example and uh, as you can see and then we get back to our onclick uh, uh, method right uh, that here and we just create an instance of this async task and give the URL to it to be executed and that's it. This async task itself creates a new thread to do the doing background and uh, it uses the UI thread to call the on post execute. And here are the parameters, uh, the parameter types that can be defined uh, when the subclassing async task. Any Android application uh, requires grant, granting permissions from the user in order to access uh, different mobile uh, features. And by default it has no permission associated with it. Therefore it cannot access data on the device. and permissions must be added in the manifest file for example here we are asking for reading the reading contacts permission and um, you can ask for accessing the network permission or accessing the location permission or accessing storage permission and more for each of them you need to grant a permission from the user and you need to list them in the in the manifest file. Android applications are not fun uh, without being connected to network like uh, internet-based applications such as social network apps or uh, multiplayer games. So let's see uh, how uh, we, can't, we can use network connectivity of the devices in Android applications. So there are net different network technologies that has different speed and reliability and cost such as Wi-Fi or LTE. For Wi-Fi you may have a free Wi-Fi at home so you can download huge number uh, amount of data for data intensive applications and for network intensive applications sorry and LTE like you can use it when uh, just you need to send um, 
compressed message uh, or lightweight messages. And application can manage uh, these connections to ensure the efficiency and responsiveness. And for this purpose, there is a pack a, a class connectivity manager that can be used. And even you can receive changes in the network connectivity uh, using uh, intents that will be broadcasted if you register for this type of changes as callback messages. So first, as I mentioned, you need user permissions to connect to the network. So there are two types of uh, mm, permissions. Internet allows applications to open network sockets and access network state allows applications to access information about the networks. To check if the network is connected, you can uh, get an instance of connectivity manager and then uh, you can get active network info uh, by calling a get active network info get an instance of network info and network info can uh, give you uh, like if it is connected or not. If it is connected, you can do network operations. Otherwise, maybe you want to ask the user, for example, to connect to network if it's necessary for your uh, operation. It also includes the type of the network connection, which there are several different types, such as mobile or Wi-Fi, or Bluetooth. The same way you can use the location feature. For the location feature you need to use location manager. And also you can use Google Maps Android API that lets you that allows you uh, to add maps to your app based on Google Maps data. The application can acquire the user location uh, utilizing GPS or Android's network location provider. There are advantages and disadvantages for each of these methods, GPS or network location provider. Network location provider determines location through cell towers and Wi-Fi signals and works indoors and outdoors and can respond faster and uses less battery power. However, GPS is more, more accurate and in fact most accurate way of um, uh, finding location and the bad part of it is that it only works outdoor and consumes battery quickly and it's slow until it gets the first location. So permission is something that you need to be granted from the user to use the location information and for that there are two way, two types of permissions one is the access find location and cores location. Find location gives you the more precise uh, location from location sources combining GPS and cell towers and Wi-Fi. However, cores location allows an app only to access proximate location that is derived from network location sources such as cell towers and Wi-Fi. You use uh, you get user locations by means of callback in Android. So first you need a reference to the system location manager as in connection manager, connectivity manager 
and then you define a listener uh, to be broadcasted by the location changes from the user so here your listener uh, for example on location change whenever the lo user's location will be changed this listener will be called and you can do uh, update your applications state and take leverage these uh, location changes also on the status changes you can do the same thing or different uh, listeners that you could have after uh, defining your uh, listeners uh, you need to register them to the location manager in order uh, to re uh, receive uh, the location updates and the way to do that is the, you have this location manager the, an instance of it and then you call the request location updates and uh, actually you um, register you give an, an, a reference of your location listener that you have defined uh, to this location manager and therefore it will be called whenever an update in the location happens if you want to know the last known location of the user to have just a quick start uh, you can um, define your location provider for example either network provider or GPS provider and then uh, you can ask the location manager to give you last known location of course this last known location can be very imprecise uh, because uh, maybe the phone can become disconnected and then just being started at very far distance and again started and before that it starts from the it can show just the last location that is very imprecise but it's uh, it can be used for different scenarios that you need a quick start of course uh, we cannot uh, cover um, all the technical aspects of Android programming in one lecture uh, and uh, therefore we stop here uh, technical aspects and we end this lecture just by uh, um, emphasizing that uh, user experience is important in Android applications and that um, it's good to start from a higher quality app to deliver to the user because it can bring higher uh, user ratings better rankings and more downloads from the beginning and uh, then uh, you should be all it should be also important uh, it is important that uh, to improve the stability and eliminate bugs as you receive feedback from users UI responsiveness is very important nobody can tolerate slow and unresponsive UI uh, and um, ease of use is also very important you should have the uh, right set of features and not complicating things with so many uh, marginal features that may just complicate using your app you can find many good suggestions and best practices to improve your application uh, following the links and I hope that uh, this lecture could be a good starting point uh, for uh, entering the mobile app programming world uh, thanks for attending this lecture I hope that you enjoyed